Hello? Hey. Hey, I can hear you 20 times better now. Okay. Oh, no, no sweats. Thank you for being patient. Um, so I want to ask you first, uh, if you could just tell me about your growing up, um, in, how do you say it? Al Dothan? <laughs> yes. I've never heard of it. I know, it is tiny. But it did produce a star up out of there by the name of Mash Dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, tell me about growing up and, and how, how music played a part in your talent. Um... Growing up there was, I mean, it's really crazy because, you know, back in uh, Alabama, it's like, uh, it's, you know, it's all white, all black, 5% other. So it's still kind of pretty like this underlying segregation that goes down there, like all the blacks stay on one side, all the whites. And a few mingle, but it's not like living in L.A. where you, or New York, where you just kind of see like a multicultural cultural thing. And, uh, and growing up where I grew up at was this place called Martin Homes, which is back then was like really, 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 really like run down and uh, drug infested, violence and all of that. And music helped me because I can, I can honestly remember like uh, rapping to Sir Mix a lot. My posse is on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> listening to my style now, listening from like trying to rap like Sir Mix a lot was a lot different then. But uh, you know, growing up to like Master P, like 8-Ball, MJG, UGK, back then was like, like, that's like my era, you know, and that's what kind of got me through a, a, a lot of things, actually, and, and saved me from a lot of, like, troubles. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Give me the juice! <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about all that. Like, um, kind of walk me, I, I read about, but walk me through, um, like, growing up in Alabama, and, and how Okay, I mean, I like how we kick it. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, what well, I mean, that was kind of crazy, you know, uh, being nine and you know coming home and you know your mom telling you like, hey, you know, you what your dad? He's he's just trying to commit suicide and you walk walk in and all you see is like blood everywhere, and he then he just disappears for like uh, you know I didn't I didn't even see him again until I was twenty. So then, you know, you kind of search for a home from the street. Like, who's your influences if your mom's working, like, two jobs a day? And then, you know, your brother, he's in school, and he, he's, trying to, he's trying to get a 9 to 5 because he just had, he, he's on his way about to have his first kid. So the streets just was like a second home to me. And, you know, next thing you know, I got it kind of linked up with, with the wrong crew. But in and and the street sense, it was kind of like the right crew because, like, next thing you know, I'm, like, moving all these, like, crazy amounts of like, you know, <laughs> drugs, you know what I'm saying, from South Florida to Dothan, Alabama, like, hey, what it do? <laughs> at, at 14, real grown, and you know, then you, because you thinking it's a game, you thinking like, hey, this is how we get money, you know, I don't know no doctors and lawyers and all of this, so this is, you know, my idols, and this is how we do it, and all of a sudden, you know, you start seeing like the destruction of it, like these guys who, who I'm playing football with in Pee Wee League, now all of a sudden, you know, they got like guns to my head saying, hey, I'm going to rob you and I'm going to blow your heads off for this right here. And you kind of looking back like, are you serious, dude? This this ain't, this wasn't the game or anything. And, and then at that point right there, once I watched my uncle die, like, because he was on drugs heavily and, uh, you know, just watching him and, you know, kind of helping him in his addiction, you know, I kind of just, you know, realized like, hey, man, this is something that I, I don't know if I want to do this for the rest of my life because I don't like the way the soul that is, is taking on me and then what it's doing in my community and the fact that this is my blood and like you get so lost in it that like you don't even show no emotions, you know? And so was it kind of like, did you feel like, you know, I'm selling this stuff and here's my uncle dying off of this stuff? Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and then I'm fighting with my brother because he didn't approve. No, like, nobody in my family approved of what I was doing because, you know, no kid, no parent want their kid to be a drug dealer. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm like this, I'm not like no petty guy. I'm like really doing it, you know, and, and you know, feds coming to the house, people kicking, the, you know, they're kicking in and, you know, people waiting outside the house all the times of night. It was, it was, that was a really, really dark era. <laughs> what, what age, from what age to what age were you in? From like 13 to 16? Okay. Yeah. 16, that's when, like, the third time or second time you got arrested? 
Well, that was, yep, towards the end, and, and that's why I was just, that's funny, because I was just kind of telling the camera guy, I was kind of like, what was the, the really defining moment in that whole thing, because, you know, first time you get caught, you're like, yeah, whatever, you know, so I got this, you know, so I just moved set, shop set up somewhere else, and then the next thing you know, you know, you get popped again, and then on your third round, you still, like, and then the, the guys who you kind of running with, you think these are your family, this is your team, they're down for you, they got your back, and then, you know, here I am locked up in a cell, and... I'm asking just for like lowrider magazines because that you know that was that was my highlight of my life then you know what I mean <laughs> and these guys wouldn't even send it to me so that's when I was like okay I'm out I can't even do this you know my mom's crying I'm killing her I didn't you know my uncle didn't pass and like I'm the black sheet of the family like something gotta something gotta be different you know say again. What did you do to put your life around at that point? Well, it's, it's actually like a series of events. Uh, it's, I met this girl. She was a cheerleader, and then she asked me. She was getting ready to go to bethune Cookman, and then she asked me, like, hey, so what are you going to do for the rest of your life? Because I'm going to go. And <laughs> and then I just got to think about it. I was just like, hey, you know, Monica, I don't, I don't think I ever want to sell drugs again. You know, like, this ain't cool, and. So that was the really defining moment because then I stopped selling drugs and, and then I started like, but I was still kind of hanging out with guys who kind of like really wasn't doing anything. So still skipping school and all of that. But it wasn't truly until I was like 19 and then I found like these other guys in school and they was actually going off to college and they was actually like my friends and and uh, they start helping me and helping me kind of find my passions. And I kind of like doing that whole dark era with the when I was selling drugs, like, I was I was listening to music, but never saying, like, hey, this is what's going to take me out of this whole situation right here, you know, I was just glad just to get out of that situation, you know what I mean? And then, you know, next thing you know, I'm, you know, I'm dropping out of high school, getting my GED, and, you know, my mom was just happy that I got my GED, she was like, I'm just glad you got your GED, son, now, whatever you want to do, it's up to you, and then, you know, next thing you know, I'm in college for a year and a half, and then, went to uh, the Navy for four, and then it wasn't to the Navy after writing lyrics all the time out to sea. Then I had this crazy, I know it sounds crazy, but I had like one of these crazy dreams that I actually came to LA and made it. And when I told everybody that I was getting out, because I hadn't made it to the intelligence part of L uh, the Navy, so everybody's like, what do you mean you're getting out to be a rapper? Nobody makes it being a rapper, that's only on TV. And I was like, nah man, this is my calling, I swear. And the rest was history. Now I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, no, I've always been like writing, but it wasn't until I got into the Navy that I actually was like, okay, I can do this. Like I actually can. I'm I'm listening to my lyrics and I'm listening to my writing, and I'm going to the studios and I was uh, I'm like, well, it was home studios then. I'm like, man, I, I feel I can do this and. Then I just took that leap of faith and just came to L.A. and then, you know, came here and met this guy who I met in Alabama once. And, you know, we went to, he, uh, we was living together in Brentwood and he told me about a party. And I went there and then uh, it was the wrong party. It was off of Doheny. Next thing you know, I end up meeting these guys who um, kind of own some big corporations. And their son was like, hey, man, you know, Sean Paul's doing a concert in my, in my city and, Winnipeg, man, I can have you open up for him if you if you down for it. So I was like, Yo, yeah. <laughs> Sean Paul, the reggae artist, 5,000 people, I'm there. <laughs> and then, like you said, rest was history. And then I, you know, got the music video, you know, Yahoo plays a single, uh, playing me down to uh, in the south. Wow. Yeah, just solo. <laughs> I want it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, we making moves over here, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the ladies right here. What's up, little mama? I see you.